Okay. Okay, so, so the talk, first 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, I'll use the slides and then move to backward. Uh, so the title of the talk is uh, Constraint Satisfaction Problems. You want to study them, what's the complexity in exact and approximate, and there's some recent interesting connections between the two. So let's start by defining what a constraint satisfaction problem is. So a constraint satisfaction problem is specified by a set of predicates, like P1 to PR, over some finite domain 1 to Q. So uh, think of this domain as 1, 2, 3, or just Boolean domain, and you have a set of predicates. So one example is uh, max cut. In max cut, the domain is 0, 1. And on the, all the constraints that you can add are of the form A not equal to B. Because every edge, you're just adding a not equal to constraint. And uh, for 3SAT, you know, you have uh, domain is again 0, 1 you have 12 different predicates that you can use. Actually, 14, because you can either use one of the three area predicates, A or B or C, not A or B or C, or A or B, and just A or not A. So uh, there are 14 different predicates, and that defines 3SAT, the problem. Right, so what, what, how does an instance of the CSP look like? You have a set of variables, x1 to xn, and you have a set of constraints on these variables. So you apply predicate P1 on x1, x2, x3, uh, and P3, 1 on the remaining variables, and so on. And you can ask two kinds of questions given an instance. One is exact CSP, where given an instance of lambda CSP, is it possible to satisfy all the constraints or not? So that is uh, exact lambda CSP. That's the question. The alternate question is you can ask, uh, suppose you're given an instance of this lambda CSP, find an assignment to the variables that satisfies the maximum number of constraints. So that would be a maximization version. Or you could look at the minimization version where you say uh, you want to violate the minimum number of constraints. So, and you'll always talk of the fraction of constraints because uh, then the objective value is always between zero and one. And uh, so these remarks I think I'll make later also. So the constraints can be weighted and so on. So I'll skip this. Okay, so, le uh, so let's look at exact lambda CSP. What is the situation here? So firstly, for Boolean exact CSPs, we know a dichotomy, meaning we know that among all Boolean C CSPs, lambda, the exact problem is in polynomial time only in the following cases. So for 2SAT, it is in polynomial time. Honsat and dual Honsat and linear equations mod 2 for which you can use Gaussian elimination and CSPs for which all zeros are all ones is a solution. So these are the only cases where it's polynomial time solvable, otherwise it's NP hard. And then you can ask, okay, so this is a list. Yes, yes, yeah, it is P or NP hard, yeah. Yeah, it can't be anything else. Uh, sparse equation with mod two. I don't think it's. Uh, as far as I, I don't know, but as far as I know, I don't think it's linear time. In general. Uh, not over f two and maybe over real second. Maybe you can do approximate things, but I'm not sure. But so any pattern? Is, is, so you can ask. Okay, so these are the polynomial time ones. Is there any pattern? Any reason why these have to be in polynomial time and the rest have to be in NP hard? And you know, indeed, you know, there is a pattern, and people have been studying this for a while now. Uh, so let's look at linear equations mod two. So, so, so given an instance of, let's say, you're given an instance of linear equations, and let's say you're given three assignments to this system, and all the three assignments are perfectly satisfiable. They satisfy all the equations in your linear system. Then you can actually uh, add these. Equa so solutions, column by column. So just add the three three solutions together. The vector you get is also a solution to the same system. So here I'm using the fact that I'm working over F2, and if you add three solutions, you get a new solution to the same system. And uh, so the point here is, 
you have this function, which is XR on three bits, and you're sequentially applying this function on uh, the values of every variable. So for x1, there are three values. I'm going to apply xr of those, get a new value. xr of these, get a new value. So you have this op function on three bits to one bit that somehow preserves the space of solutions, that takes solutions to feasible solutions. And you know, in a sense, this is what makes linear equations easy. So it's, you know, so this is, you know, what is called a polymorphism. So, so a polymorphism is essentially a function from uh, r bits to one bit. So r is some constant, think of it as three or seven or something. It's a function from r bits to one bit such that if you're given an instance of the CSP and if you're given r assignments which satisfy all the constraints, you apply the function bitwise on each bit, each variable. So you look at the first variable, it has r values, you apply it, f, you get a new. So f is like addition or model two or some other operation and you do it. And the new assignment you get also satisfies all the constraints. Then we call the function f a polymorphism for this CSP lambda. So, uh, so is the definition clear? I, I guess. Uh. So it's, it's not necessarily close on the complement, right? It's all the assignments falsify the register. It doesn't mean that the yeah. combination is falsified. Right? Yeah, yeah. It just has to work in this direction. Yes. Yeah, so most of the talk, the definitions will be a tricky part. The proofs will be very simple. So stop me whenever the definition is actually not clear. So who uh, first realizes or you were referring to? Oh, so this was, I think, after Schaeffer's theorem. Uh, Jevons realized. Jevons, yeah. It's not obvious. It's not obvious, but it's a result. It's proven now that if you have an operation which satisfies what's called a marked save condition, essentially f of x x x y y is equal to f of y y x equal to x. If you have any three bit operation that satisfies this, then you have a polytime algorithm for the CSP. No, you just have f have access to f, so you really do not have. Uh, do not know. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, uh, oh, oh, that I'm not sure. Uh, Oh, so you're assuming the arity of to be three and you have specific form for three, well, so. So, so, you know, first of all, I'm going to say a trivial thing that, you know, if you look at the dictator functions, they are actually polymorphisms for all CSPs because if I give it a bunch of solutions and apply the ith dictator, so when I apply the ith dictator here, it'll output the ith bit, ith bit, ith bit, so it'll just copy the entire ith solution down which means I'll get back the one of the solutions I started with. So it's not a non-trivial polymorphism, but it's a polymorphism. So every, every CSP has this. So we really want to expect that non-trivial operations are actually what uh, makes us easy. And you know, indeed, for uh, 
all the tractable cases, there are non-trivial operations. So uh, for all the tractable Boolean CSPs, like linear equations mod 2, there is XOR, 2SAT, there is majority, and HONSAT, there is AND. and uh, So what this means is that if I take a bunch of assignments for 2SAT which satisfy all the constraints, apply majority, then I get a new solution which satisfies all the constraints. Uh, so this can be three or anything, right? And 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 or I mean for all, all larities. Yeah. So even two here would work, three or anything. But uh, uh, yes, the set of polymorphisms will characterize the language, but I'm not sure if just majority will characterize two set. There are maybe uh, there are other polymorphisms for. Set, I think. I'm not an expert on this. Okay. So, uh, actually, I guess I attribute this. This is, I think, shown by Jeevans first. So, the, the, the fact that this polymorphisms is what determines the complexity of a CSP. So, if you have two CSPs, lambda 1, lambda 2, with the same set of polymorphisms, they are polytime reducible to each other. Uh, so this is what determines the complexity. So, so we know what determines the complexity here. And uh, you know, the, uh, right now there's an algebraic dichotomy conjecture by Bulatov, Jeevans, and Krokin. It says that, and I'm stating it very, very roughly here because I'm not going to state formally. Uh, I'm just saying that uh, exact lambda CSP is in P if and only if there are non-trivial polymorphisms. So what are non-trivial polymorphisms? Polymorphisms that are very different from dictators. So you know, if you want to make it more precise, you have to say that lambda is a core, and uh, um, so so he, uh, and you know you're po you have polymorphisms that are not juntas in a uh, not junta in a different uh, notion of uh, being a junta. But you know, I, I, uh, yeah, I, I will not get into this. So I just want to give the flavor that it's actually just being not juntas. But of course, the notion of being junta is different. Constant number of coordinates have a every constant, every constant number of coordinates have a distributional influence less than a constant. Distributional influences. So if I look at XR function, every coordinate has influence one. But if I just look at the output distribution, which is if I feed in bits with half half uh, probability, the output is half half unbiased. And if I change one of the distributions of one of the bits, does it change? Or how much does it change the distribution of the output? Uh, so this is actually recent work by Kuhn and Segadi. But the algebraic, at least you know, it's very there are much simpler uh, ways to state it. Algebraically, the way to state it is, uh, you have an operation f of Larger and larger rarity such that f of x x x x x y is equal to f of x y x x x x x and all the it's a un kind of a unanimity. If everybody votes for x and one body one person votes for y, you would vote. It it is symmetric. So uh, yeah. So I I will not be getting into this, but yeah, just to give a flavor. Uh, there is a one dimensional distribution. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So one direction of it is actually fairly easy to prove. The fact that if there are no non-trivial polymorphisms, then it is NP-hard. So we need non-trivial polymorphisms to actually have a poly any algorithm uh, in this case. And you know, indeed, this conjecture is proven for domain size 2 and 3. And uh, we know that if the CSP is tractable, if you have many different kinds of operations, like near unanimity, Malt save. Uh, we know se several cases where it's tractable. So what is actually left is to show the tractable case of this, uh, the other side where you have to show that some CSPs are in P. That's the part. And there are concrete examples for CSPs that are not non-trivial. Uh, no. So that is a. Pr so the thing is, uh, most of the study will move into not the CSP but the polymorphisms. So there are concrete examples of algebras or polymorphisms, sets of polymorphisms, where you do not know how to get an algorithm. 
but the, I mean, you can po pro probably get an explicit uh, example with those polymorphisms, but. There is a unique CSP which is associated with every set of those which are invariant under it. But the problem is uh, you, I mean, it's not efficient. You cannot really, you cannot really, and you know, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So the, uh, so the work in this area is mostly in the other, people don't look at CSPs at all. They look at polymorphisms fully. So you don't have examples. Uh, Okay, so now I'll get into Mac CSP, and uh, uh, this is where I'll switch from uh, slides to uh, this. So, uh, so let's see what is going on with Mac CSP in this uh, aspect. But before that, let me set up some, you know, just recall some notation. Uh, so you have a lambda which is set of predicates, and uh, uh, you have a set of variables b. I will use y1 to yn. Oh, actually, yeah. Okay, so this is the CSP. So an instance i will have a set of variables, v1, you know, y1 to yn, and a, I'll use a probability distribution p over constraints. P1, p2. So essentially, I'm assuming that the constraints are weighted so that they form a probability distribution, just to, so that always talking about one not zero. So, uh, for instance, if I look at an assignment x, you know, so actually, if, for most of the talk, I'll be using 0, 1. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can think of q to be 2. If, so, if, if I look at an assignment x, then its value is essentially, you know, how, what fraction of constraints it satisfies. Uh, so, I would say expectation over a predicate chosen from this distribution of p of x. So actually, p looks like looks at only few bits of x, but I can't represent it. So, yeah. so the distribution specifies not only which predicate, but which tuple of variables you're applying. It yes, yes, yeah. It specifies. This is an instance, so it specifies exactly what are the constraints are. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah, I want actually. Uh, actually, I could make it. Right. So I yeah. X sub v of p. So v of p is the variables of the predicate, and so uh, okay. Okay, so now the question is we are given an instance and we want to find an assignment with maximum value or the minimum value it doesn't. Uh, matters. Okay, this is. okay, so you know we want to say that the same polymorphism thing works here also. So ideally we want to define an approximate polymorphism. So an approximate polymorphism, the way you would say is uh, you know F is an approximate polymorphism you know, some, let's say, alpha approximate polymorphism, if I give you solutions to some instance, each of value C, and if I apply F on this bitwise, the new solution I get has value at least alpha times C. This would, what, this is essentially what you want to say. F is, a, any, if any operation is a polymorphism if this is true. Uh, but for approximation purposes, actually, it seems like we, we need to look at not just functions which are output bits, 
but distribution orbits. So I'll, I'll define a little bit more notation before I actually define an approximate polymorphism. So, but the intuition is just that. It, it's an operation which combines solutions of value C to output of solution of value alpha times C. So firstly, you know, a distributional function is a, you know, essentially. Oh, OK, yeah, yeah. Thanks. So uh, to a distribution over q minus 1. So uh, if it's the Boolean world, you can just think of it as It outputs a value between one and minus one, which is like the uh, bias of that. Uh, oh, it's a distributional function. Uh, it's just a function which outputs a distribution uh, instead of a bit. And uh, uh, so, so what we'd be working with is uh, DDFs. These are distribution over these distributional functions. So, uh, so I'll say a, f a function f is a DDF. It essentially means I can sample a function f from this, and f is a DF. It's like a distribution over several functions. So I'll give an example, and it will be much more clearer. So, so okay. So instead of one function, you have multiple functions to combine. This is just a, okay. And so, so in the previous thing, I just said uh, you want to know the set of polymorphisms, and here you have approximate polymorphisms. Uh, no, each of them is not a good polymorphism. So, you know, a given function in this distribution could do badly when you combine solutions. But in expectation, yeah. so the polymorphism itself is a distribution over functions. It's a DDF, yeah. A polymorphism is a DDF. And unlike there, you every every DDF is a polymorphism with some alpha. Alpha could be bad; it could be zero, but it's a polymorphism with some alpha. So I'll define uh, uh, what is an alpha alpha approximate DDF. Al sorry, actually, I'll just say alpha approximate polymorphism. So this is a crucial definition. So, um, so you say that a function, no, sorry, a DDF f is an alpha approximate polymorphism if you know for all any giv given any instance i instance of the problem. And given any set of solutions, so uh, so, uh, so I'm assuming that everything in the DF has the same arity, but it's just uh, given any set of R solutions to this instance, and such that you know the value of each of these solutions is actually at least c for some c okay then if i look at the value of the combined solution it has to be at least alpha times c so what is the combined solution how do you combine so you have a distribution of functions you pick a dis function from that distribution 
So you say, OK, I'm going to use lick this f. And now we are going to use f to combine each of the bits. So you will uh, this is what uh, so. Um, Uh, right. So f outputs a distribution. So actually, I'll call this twiddle. Uh, you know, f outputs. Oh sorry, no, sorry, sorry. Uh, twiddle. So you you gen you know you apply f to the solutions. Sorry, you apply f to the solutions. What you get is another vector. Each point is actually a distribution now. And uh, yeah. The, the GDF has two kinds of randomness. So the first kind is the global randomness. Yes. That you're using to take the F. But then you then have local independent randomness between each coordinate. Yeah, exactly. Based on the, on the, the second GDF. Exactly, yeah. So actually, you know, uh, you know as a picture, so you have these solutions now. So these are 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. So you have R solutions. What you do is you apply F to each of them. So what you get is some value between some distribution over 0, 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, some, some distribution over 0, 1, each, each, each point. You just independently round it to 0, 1. It's independently sample from each of them. So is that? Uh, so in, in general, so if we were just in the zero one case, we could just think of f as outputting a real number and just extend each predicate, take real numbers as input, and give out uh, the the expectation that it would uh, be satisfied. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you could do that. Yeah, yeah. So as uh, yeah, right. So essentially, you know, the way to do it is you pick f from this distribution, then you, uh, so that's one randomness, which is global randomness. Then you look look at f of x1 to xr, and each of the bits you repeat, you uh, know, independently. Uh, so, uh, oh yes, uh, thanks, yeah. So this, this value should be at least alpha c. The, Yeah. Couldn't you just define it predicate by predicate, or as it's known? Uh, so you you cannot define it predicate by predicate because um, because you are looking at this sum and um, can't say for any predicate it's it's most of the x i to satisfy the predicate. Yes, you can define predicate by predicate, but uh, you have to still have an instance of that using that predicate, because uh, so for instance you look at look at max cut or something, right? In max cut, oh, the there's only one predicate, but there are edges of different lengths. So what the instance is actually an average of the edges of different lengths. So your polymorphism could do well on some length lengths, could do badly on some lengths. On average, it could still get 0.878 or something. So you should so you want you still want an instance. The instance could have the same predicate, but. Yeah, so, uh, so. Um, Not just intersection, like uh, if, if you have a polymorphism. No, so, so uh, um, right, it makes it uh, harder, yeah. Um, but. You would define approximation for the entire problem, right? So suppose I have a problem where I have two sat where I can allow constraints of two literals or three literals. It's a combination of two sat, uh, two two CNF and three CNF constraints. Now, if this is your problem, then you should do well even only if I give you only two CNF constraints, 
or only three CNF constraints. You should still get some alpha. So, uh, but you know, all all these variants, you know, the entire thing still goes through. For instance, you can do the following. Uh, what can you say here? So whatever I'm going to say. So you, for instance, I can do s still say the following. You can define not just uh, three set. You can define. Uh, 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 3 sat with what's the probability that you get this predicate, what's the probability that you get this predicate. You can say, let's look at the problem uh, 3 sat, I'll call it, let's say 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, uh, 0 0.4, okay. This, and what is this? Essentially with 0 0.2 fraction of the constraints are single literal constraints, 0 0.4 fraction of the constraints are double literal constraints, 0 0.4 fraction of the constraints are tri triple literal constraints. You know, this is this is how all your instances will look. They have 20% of this kind, 40% of this kind, 40% of this kind. And then you can ask, okay, for this problem, I could be doing better than seven eighths or whatever. And you know, everything, you could still define approximate polymorphism for this and for that alpha and everything will go through. So you would get a good algorithm for this, hardness and everything. And you want the, the definition to work for every C? Uh, yeah, here I've defined it for every C. You could also fix every C. So uh, that was my next definition. So if there is uh, any other question? Oh, so yeah. In the exact case, uh, you know, you have the polymorphism for, if you mix, mix your predicates, the polymorphism would have to be a polymorphism for all the predicates. So the, you know, the, the intersection of Right, right, right. So you could go from home of a prime sense, you could do that. Or is there more happening here? So is it is it just that if you have multiple predicates, the set of polymorphisms is the intersection of the two sets of predicates? Uh, so here there is, um, so you know, th this constant. Uh, is it, e oh, it's contained in the intersection, is it equal to, I have to think about it, I don't know, if, uh, I don't think it should be the always equal to, there should be CSPs where it should. Uh, Actually, uh, for example, if you have this preset, x1 or x2, not x1, and not x2, uh, if you just have one of them, then it will put away the problem. But once you mix your preset of Right, right. Well, yeah. Right. That's what. Uh, that's what. So if you look at, mm, if I don't allow negations, for instance, that's uh, you know, or it's only a specific set of negations, then uh, it's easier than general two set. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if you did it the other way, it would be the other constant function, but the intersection would be the bit mapping. Yeah, ex exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, so alpha C approximate polymorphism is where I fix alpha, fix C. For a given C, I ask what is the thing, and alpha C approximate polymorphism is when I fix uh, C. So uh, this is for case when you're interested in what's the best approximation for max cut on instances with value 0.51. Then you can fix C to be 0.51 and find what is the best way to combine solutions. So, did, did anybody see whether in the exact case you can, uh, for the, I don't know, maybe a, a double, whether you could get the alpha to be 0.99999? Uh, in the exact case, they, they don't know how to find the polynomial time algorithm in some cases, but can they satisfy an arbitrary? Uh, so, uh, so there is a connection. So, if you look at two sat, uh, majority is a polymorphism. Yeah. At one minus epsilon, it is pretty good. Even it is a good polymorphism, even in the approximation yeah. sense. It's one minus root epsilon, and that's where the one minus root epsilon uh, comes from. Yeah. So, 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 so,
still like, somewhat confusing uh, because the definition is like more complicated because you have like for every instance. Suppose you just define that for every predicate, uh, you have this property that the value of uh, f, uh, you know, that the t applies, f, uh, yeah. applies to f will be, uh, and if, if the predicate is satisfied, then it will be at least alpha. Would that be equivalent? Uh, uh, so you need f not just for every predicate, but you need uh, for every distribution of inputs. So here, all these do not satisfy all the constraints, right? They satisfy only. So for instance, uh, let's look at um, just max cut. So suppose I have a graph, right, and I have R solutions with value fifty one percent. In some solutions, uh, R solutions with value fifty one percent. Okay, and on some edges they could be cut in all these solutions. So their value could be like 0 0.9. Mm -hmm. But on some, uh, on some other edges, they, they could be cut in a few of these solutions. So you want to, you want the, uh, you want the output to be good even. Yeah, but why is that just linearity of expectation? Uh, so not when you mix different distributions of edges, right? Um, Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, so. So, so. So, so even if you had max cut where there's just one predicate, you s I think you still need to work with, I mean, okay, I know you don't, but uh, you know, because of some other way, but it takes a proof. I, uh, in, uh, you still need to work with distribution because essentially if you look at majority function, uh, it's, Oh, you can work with a single predicate, yeah. What? You can work with a single predicate, but you need to worry about distribution of the, so instead of. Start with the assumption that the value on every edge is t, then you get something. Yeah, yeah, you can't start okay. with that assumption. So you can just say if the values are whatever on every edge, then you get alpha times the average. If for every predicate you can guarantee that, yeah. then it works. Right, that, that's, then it works for linearity. Uh, yeah, so you need to worry, about, yeah. So you could restate this definition. You could have to change it to some distribution, and you have to worry about. So I, I just instead of doing working with distribution, I'm working with specific. You know, once you fix an instance, uh, so actually I'll come to this point later again. Uh, so. Yeah. Oh, each each solution is at least value c. Oh. So uh, alpha times the, so I think alpha times the average might work, but uh, I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, alpha times, yeah, you, you need, uh, you need uh, each one to be C. Yeah, minimum. So. Okay, so I'll give an example now, actually, so after I so the example is actually uh, oh yes actually yeah, let me just do this one. okay so you know, s the well known submodularity is like an example of a one approximate polymorphism so suppose you pre pre suppose the predicate p's, the all the predicates, oh sorry, uh, okay, so predicates p are uh, submodular, uh, su supermodular or submodular, uh, actually let me say supermodular. So what does that mean? If I look at p applied on a vector x and I look at p applied on a vector y,
this is what uh, is supermodularity. And uh, so uh, this is essentially an example of a one approximate polymorphism. Because what is the polymorphism? So the polymorphism F has two operations. One is or, the other is and, each with probability half. And uh, these are actually not uh, distributional functions, but they're actual functions. They output 0 or 1 when you feed in 0, 1. And uh, you know, if x has value c, y has value c, then you know that p, uh, this has value c. So, so our y plus p of x and y by 2 is actually at least c. So this is a one approximate uh, uh, polymorphism. Oh, uh, so there is a, <coughs> so, uh, so there is this, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but what's the example of a submodel? Uh, so there is this x1, um, so I think uh, constraints of the form like a and b and c are not you know, d f and not e and not f. Like you have two uh, conjunctions, one has only positive literals, other has only negative literals. Yeah. These kind of predicates, they are supermodular. Uh, so that actually, yeah, one just has to check it. Yeah, there's no, I don't know of a good proof. Uh, yeah. It just, you know, t pick, uh, let's look at this predicate, look at a solution where p of x is one, you know, either this has to be one or this has to be one, and then, then you can, uh, then it will be, Easy to verify that it's actually, um, yeah. And uh, in, the, in what I you know, I will come back to this later. It doesn't even matter for what I'm going to say th that these are or on land. We just uh, they could have been any other functions. Uh, just uh, 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 yes, yes, or uh, or the other way is uh, uh, cut, min cut, min cut is submodular, min cut is submodular, and uh, uh, so that's uh, so if uh, min st cut is submodular, or even min cut is submodular, so. Oh, this is submodular. This is submodular. Oh, so x, so so here, x. Oh, actually, the x is a vector. X one to x n, right? X k, and y is another vector. Y one to y k. So this is essentially two sets, and here I'm looking at their union and their intersection. Yes, yeah. X one to x arity of the constraint. So this is just the exact usual notion. X is a set, Y is a set. You know, I'm just using zero one representation and or and and are just union and intersection. So you still use the external and the net, right? I mean yeah, you only use the external. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, you need the external randomness because e either of them is bad. Okay, so that is, uh, okay, that's the definition of uh, uh, alpha approximate polymorphism. And now uh, we need to we need to say what is we we are we will only be interested in polymorphisms that are actually not dictators, right? Because dictators are trivially one approximate, just because of the same uh, property. So, so to say wh what is a not dictator, we need some notation. Uh, we need some technical tools. So. We'll be worried about real valued functions. So throughout this talk, we'll be worried of Boolean functions. And you have some product distribution on the uh, Boolean domain. So it's the same product, uh, mu cross mu cross mu cross mu. It's not mu one cross mu two cross mu three. And uh, then, um, 
So uh, the noise operator on a function is just uh, a way to smoothen the function. Yeah, essentially it's the bias, or uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, given a function, the no, we use the distribution on the input, but so I'm. F is a polymorphism. So, so yeah, yeah, we'll be working. So what, what will be uh, so uh, yeah, we'll uh, see that. <laughs> so you have real world function, and you have some product distribution. Uh, the noise operator is the following. Given the function, it will output another function, t1 minus epsilon f. And it is just expectation of f of y, where y is a random epsilon perturbation of x. What it means is you have an x to evaluate t1 minus epsilon f at x. You generate y by setting yi equal to xi with probability 1 minus epsilon. A random, otherwise with probability epsilon, you set it to a random value from your distribution mu. And that is, uh, and you take the average over all these y's, that is t1 minus epsilon. So essentially, it makes the function low degree. Any given function, it makes it degree one over epsilon, roughly. Approximately, Approximately yeah, yeah. And uh, so th this is the crucial notion. We'll be worried about influences. So given a Boolean a function, minus one, one to the R2, real numbers, define the influence of the ith coordinate under a product distribution mu to be the following. You randomly fix every other coordinate according to the distribution mu. And now you, you haven't fixed the ith coordinate. Now randomly fix i and look at the variance of this random variable. And that is just take the expectation. So it's the expectation of the variance. Or you know, if this confuses, you can just, um, you know, for Boolean fun if the output is Boolean, you can just think of it as. What is the chance that after fixing all the remaining coordinates, the ith coordinate still matters? Within a constant factor, it will be the same. So, so that is uh, influence. And um, you, you know, you need to talk about influence of the ith coordinate under a given distribution. So, so, uh, so that, that that's it. So now we can uh, define uh, what is a non-dictator polymorphism. Uh, DDF is uh, tau quasi random if for all f in the uh, okay DDF f for all f in f uh, for all product distributions mu and for all i all the influences are less than tau. So no matter what product distribution you put what coordinate you look at, and any function in the distribution, all your influences are small. So that's a quasi-random uh, DDF. So okay, so finally, uh, after so much definition, we can. Uh, so you just need the same products. So when yeah yeah. So whenever I say product distribution, I mean. Uh, um, mu to the r, a given mu, mu cross mu cross mu cross mu. Yeah, okay, so finally we can define, uh, okay, what we expect to be the correct approximation ratio for a given problem. So, uh, actually let me keep it here. So alpha sub lambda is essentially so that might be very tricky because then every function has uh, is influential under some product distribution because you can fix the product distribution on the remaining coordinate such that this coordinate becomes influential. Ah, okay. So. 
Yeah, so it is alpha sub lambda for a given problem is the best alpha such that there exists alpha. Uh, oh, yeah, it's the largest. Uh, well, uh, yeah, let's see. Largest alpha such that uh, there exists uh, tau quasi random alpha approximate poly for all tau greater than zero. Oh, this, okay, okay. So this, uh, so essentially it's just uh, the largest alpha such that there is an alpha approximate polymorphism for every tau. For every, no matter how quasi-random you want, there is some polymorphism with that much quasi-random, which is alpha approximate. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, so for every C, yeah, I'm just defining alpha approximate. You could also talk about alpha sub lambda of C. So the arity is allowed to depend on tau? Right? Arity can be anything, yeah. So, uh, so here again the example is, uh, if you pick max cut, if you pick max uh, alpha to be 0.878, then majority on arbitrary number of bits gives you 0.878 all the time. And as you increase the number of bits, the influence goes down, so you can. Uh, it's for every tau. So I'm just taking the. Right. Oh, oh, for oh, <laughs> for the CSP. <laughs> Alpha polymorphism for s max lambda CSP. Uh, so it's a decreasing sequence, right? And it's you know it's bounded between zero and one, and it's decreasing because whenever I add more lesser tau, I'm just making it more constrained, the problem more and more constrained, and it's lower bounded by zero because I can output a random function, and so it's I think I mean the limit exists, uh, but otherwise also you could. You know. Okay, so so alpha sub lambda of c is essentially the same thing. So here I'll say alpha comma C approximate polymorphism. So uh, is it clear? Right, so uh, okay, so actually I will uh, uh, give a sh quick definition of unique games conjecture, assuming uh, a lot of people know it here. So unique games conjecture is essentially, so I'm going to state an equivalent version, which is simpler. Uh, for all eta, there exists a number p, natural number p, such that following problem is NP hard. What is the problem? Uh, so yeah, I'll define the simpler version with running out of time. So the simpler version is you are, uh, the, so the problem is you're given a set of linear equations modulo p of the form, you know, you're given equations of the form xi minus xj is equal to cij mod p. So you're given a set of linear equations, each equation is exactly of this form, and uh, you want to distinguish whether this system is 99% satisfiable or near unsatisfiable. So what is the case one? 
Oh, actually. So you want to distinguish between case one, uh, there exists an assignment. Okay, yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah. So case one, the value of the instance is actually greater than one minus eta, or case two, value of the instance is less than or equal to eta. So Unique games conjecture says that this problem is hard when you pick p to be sufficiently large. Okay, so now what does unique games conjecture say about these quantities is what uh, will be the topic now. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to state a few theorems now. So, assuming unique games conjecture, you know, for all CSPs lambda, uh, you know, it is NP hard to approximate better than alpha sub lambda. So, if you assume the unique games conjecture, for all CSPs, alpha sub lambda is the correct hardness threshold. So this is actually, uh, you know, it, it I mean, once you have these definitions, it almost follows from the work of uh, KKMO. It's just uh, very easy. So actually, indeed, you know, unique games as David suggested is also a CSP. So its approximability should also be determined by polymorphisms. So you can, write a stronger version here, which becomes equivalent almost trivially. Uh, what is a stronger version? It's saying that for all lambda and for all c, given an instance of given i with value c, it, it the same thing. It's NP-hard to approximate better than alpha sub lambda of c. So if you assume that the polymorphism determine not just for every CSP, but at every location, then it's equivalent to unique games conjecture. And the equivalence is, you know, it's just a trivial, the other direction is just a triviality because, I mean, um, not, not so, I mean, it, it, it easy to see from, uh, um, yeah. And you have to. You have to Yes, yes, it's, so it's uh, definitely not a uh, triviality, so I took it back. So it's actually very non trivial to prove the plurality is uh, stablest or some form of plurality of stablest to prove it. But now it's uh, proven, so we know this direction. So it's equivalent now. So the unique games conjecture is equivalent to saying that these polymorphisms determine the, the approximation ratios, which is essentially what the algebraic says in the algebraic dichotomy conjecture says about uh, exact CSPs. Yeah. I'm so confused about the bona fide for tau in this case. Should we regard the tau functions as for every tau, the recursive tau talking around them? Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, actually, yeah. I should make it for every tau. Yeah. The Alpha tau, yeah. What is delta? Lambda, sorry, lambda. Alpha lambda tau. Yeah, you can take the infimum, yeah, yeah. So this is what uh, uh, is true. What about, you know, this is the hardness. This is only saying that you cannot do better. The question is, can you do at least this much? Uh, so this is actually true that for all uh, lambda, uh, there is an SDP, which I'll call it the basic SDP a basic semi-definite program uh, gives uh, alpha sub lambda approximation. So 
So the basic semi-definite program, which I'll describe later, actually gives alpha sub lambda approximation for every CSP. So it matches this. So this is actually okay. Uh, so you know this finishes what uh, uh, you know what we want to know about. Uh, about the approximation thresholds, but it doesn't tell you anything about the value of the threshold. So, uh, so I'm not going to state the result, but you, you can actually compute these approximation thresholds up to an error epsilon in doubly exponential time in epsilon. So you can, if you want, you can find out what this uh, alpha sub lambda is for a given CSP. And uh, the reason you can do it is because you have to enumerate instances of some small size like Yes, yeah, the either you can think of it that way or you could enumerate all uh, dictatorship tests, which is also another way. To, but yeah, there are multiple ways to do it. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so we also know now that uh, if you take this basic SDP and you strengthen it by adding some levels of Shirley Adams on it, you still only get an alpha sub lambda approximation. You don't get anything better for any CSP, so it's exact. Uh, the integrality gap of this SDP is equal to alpha sub lambda, and it's equal even if you add Shirley Adams up to. So, but I am used to mean the LP version. Yeah, like Shirley Adams, SDP. yeah, uh, LP plus SDP, yeah. Right. Integral basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay, so I like to, uh, yeah, should we take a break? Or? As you wish, you are the boss. <laughs> So, so, we, so we could take a short break. I'll just make a few remarks. And uh, so uh, a few remarks. Uh, first of all, uh, so now we know this. OK, this is for CSPs. Actually, now we know this for other problems, like uh, you know, ordering CSPs, like max acyclic subgraph, metric labeling. M metric labeling is like cut problems, like min cut or uh, min three-way cut. So if I give you a graph and give you three terminals, and say, hey, ST, I give you ST and U, and you want to separate such that minimum number of edges get cut. There also, the corresponding alpha is the best approximation under UGC, and the basic SDP gives you that. And uh, in fact, even the LP gives you that. And even Grothendieck uh, problem. And so, so that is, uh, so it's like a fairly general class of problems which, for which polymorphism seem to determine the thing. And, uh, so let me derive uh, an easy consequence of uh, this theorem. It's just uh, fun. Uh, so, just, so, I want to, uh, so one easy consequence of this theorem is that uh, submodular CSPs are actually polytime solvable. Uh, so what what are we missing? We need the we know that submodularity is one approximate polymorphism. We just don't know that it is actually a low influence one approximate polymorphism. So we want to construct one a low influence from this. So, Sorry, no, so, uh, so we know that, as we saw here, submodularity, you know, submodularity essentially implies a one approximate polymorphism. The same theorem. Right. So you could, you know, you could just use this theorem and say, well, basic SDP gives a one approximation. But the problem is, you do not have you know, this or and and on two bits are not low influence functions. Yeah, no, it has to, the RIT has to go with the... Uh, yeah, I mean, they don't, they operate only on two bits, so their uh, their uh, influences are like half or something. So you want a low influence polymorphism out of uh, this, uh, a low influence one approximate polymorphism, then you will be able to apply this. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of uh, X1, if you use p of x1 plus p of x2 plus p of x3 plus p of x4. So if I combine these two and these two, I get four terms. Which yeah, essentially. Yeah, you get balance. yeah balanced standard trees. You get x1 or x2 plus p of x1 and x2, x3 or x4 plus p of x3 and x4. Sorry, this is less than equal to. Now I'll uh, combine these two and these two differently. Like I'm, I'm going to combine or with or and and with and. 
So I will get uh, four trees of depth two. So one tree will be and and or or and 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 or and or. So if you started with uh, two to the k inputs here you would get uh, two to the k different uh, and or trees. And these trees all have the same pattern. You know, every, every gate at the same level is the same. So this is, looks good. It has a lot of arity. So it could be a low influence function. Now, what is an easy proof that it's a low influence function is that these are actually, the leaves of these trees are symmetric. So any leaf is identical to any other leaf. Just because this you know, and is symmetric, you can flip that, then ors are symmetric. So all the inputs are identically so influenced. There is a transitive group. Yeah. So the influence can be made as small as possible after the nice. Uh, so, yeah. So. So what is that? Uh, so uh, can you unroll it for cut? What are you saying? Oh, so for cut, you are proving that uh, SGP gives you one approximation. SGP is integral. How is that going? How is going? It, how is it going? Is uh, you have this. Uh, I'm I'm exhibiting one approximate polymorphisms for cut, which have very very low influence, as low as you want. Uh, the polymorphism is actually, uh, it's like you pick a random, you pick a binary tree, and at each level, randomly put either or or and. Yeah, it's not a trivial proof how to get from a polymorphism to a, to a demonstrated SDP for cut. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, 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 but I'm just, yeah. So we, we, we're not, we're not a cut no, 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 I'm, ju I'm just saying the, the, this is a consequence, not the theorem itself. Yes, and all of them are symmetric. All of them are symmetric. And you're only going to use symmetry to prove low. I don't understand that, because parity is symmetric. Right, so I, I hid something here, right? So what did I hide? Uh, so I'm going to apply noise to the, to the functions. It's not going to be x1 or x2. It's t1 minus epsilon of this. Then the sum of influences is bounded. So any function whose sum of influence is bounded and is symmetric in the variables has uh, and uh, yeah. So it has uh, then would you still replace that with uh, oh, the tau cosine omega definition which you wanted? Uh, tau cosine. Uh, oh, tau epsilon. Co uh, uh, no, no. Uh, so. No, so the definitions have been optimized so that you don't have to do such things. But, yeah. but the point is that for these functions, if you add noise, it's still a polymorphism? A every polymorphism, if it's an alpha approximate polymorphism, if you add noise, it's only at least alpha minus epsilon. But if you have something for which the parity is an uh, polymorphism, and you add noise, you'll ruin it. Right? Uh, like for example, we don't know how to approximate the three No, no, but not, uh, not if it is. Uh, not if it is in the approximation ratio world, right? Uh, so uh, actually, I'll be, that'll be one lemma which I'll prove later. So, but uh, that was just like a one line proof, yeah. Uh, when you add noise, you will ruin the one, right? You want to keep one. Yeah, you'll get one minus epsilon. Oh, you get one minus epsilon. And ep epsilon can tend to zero. So you're just proving a fact that the SDP is integrality gap is one. And uh, yeah, any given polymorphism will not give you the cut, but it will tend to that. And Yeah, it's uh, like it's a you know, it's a sequence of rounding schemes which give you better one minus epsilon, but the rounding schemes you know take more and more uh, um, inputs. You know if you, but you know in this case you can actually run this rounding if because yeah. you know the f you know the set of uh, polymorphisms, you can actually sample easily from them. But yeah. so what you said is I'm showing that the SDP integrality gap is more than one minus epsilon for every epsilon, okay. which means uh, the integrality gap has to be one. Not zero. Uh, 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 I'm showing that on any given instance, the integrality gap is one minus epsilon for every epsilon. 
it, I mean, I have a rounding set of rounding schemes which get you one minus epsilon for every epsilon, yeah. right? And then. Yes, okay. yes. So but uh, uh, the part of it is that the gamma tau, tau gamma. for one. Oh, for which? For so the parity is a polymorphism for which? Really? Really? really. Oh, really. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's a, it's a polymorphism only at c equal to one, right? If Even if you have c equal to one minus epsilon, it's half. So it's actually a half polymorphism mm -hmm. in this oh. definition. It's actually one one polymorphism or it's any half polymorphism. So you get a half approximation, not a, yeah. So if I get into Cs, I'll have to do shady things here. I'd say C minus epsilon, epsilon tending to one and so on. But that's, uh, yeah, I, that's why I didn't want to yeah, like get into that. But, yeah. okay, so we, we have time for 12.30, yeah. right? 12.30, yeah, so 12 30. Five, seven, seven minutes, right? Yeah, seven, five, five. 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 <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's at least much cleaner. I, I would I never hope to present the earlier proof, right? So, this is. So, goal now is we'll show the unconditional part, which is the algorithmic part. We'll show that for every CSP lambda, the basic SDP gives you alpha sub lambda approximation. And, uh, so we need to essentially round the STP. But so first, what is a basic STP? Yeah, does it say anything interesting about like, uh, the exact trick? Because that's the, the algorithmic part is what's missing there. Uh, yeah, so, so, um, so, uh, so, it, it, uh, so, uh, so it does in a sense. But mm, I, I can't prove it precisely. But the uh, point is, what C you'll ask what CSPs have a one comma, no, a one minus epsilon comma one minus eta approximation for all eta epsilon, for, for all eta, yeah, so for all eta. So if you look at two sat, you really have an approximation scheme. So you have a p cast, like you would say that all of these uh, polymorphism where they're looking for an algorithm, you don't know if they have an algorithm for the exact, for sure they have a p cast. Uh, no, no, don't have. No, you don't have, for essentially, uh, CSPs which have. Uh, ah, because of this, so. It's yeah, yeah. But, but, but do you know somehow exactly the class of polymorphism that they are? Um, so, so, th so they, you know, their CSPs, you know, somehow you can s split it into those which contain linear equations. I'm being very imprecise here. Mm -hmm. And those which do not contain, okay? Uh, when those which do not contain, these can be solved by local propagation style algorithms. And these cannot. These are not bounded width, these are bounded width. Now, th those which do contain linear equations, uh, do not contain linear equations, uh, no, they can be solved by local propagation. So in particular, we know that SDP solves it. So we know that SDP solves them. Now, if you want to prove it this way, you will have to prove that there is a, there are good polymorphisms. So like 2SAT is an example of this. And we know that majority function on uh, 1 minus epsilon, it's 1 minus root epsilon. So it's a 1 minus epsilon comma 1 minus root epsilon polymorphism, uh, or vice versa actually, right? So now you can make epsilon tend to 0 and show that the SDP gap is actually The left side, uh, yeah, this actually recently has been proven, uh, the ca characterization of this part. Mm -hmm. uh, this part actually, uh, yeah, I mean, we know no Gaussian elimination, but you know, we, we can't it combine the two. So, so you can't help this? No, no.
Okay, so let me state the it's uh, all the pages I got inverted. Okay, let, let me state the SDP. Uh, yeah, so uh, again, uh, yeah, so we have an instance y1 to yn, and we have these predicates. So the SDP is essentially, so I'm only gonna do the Boolean case. And uh, so what are the variables in this semi-definite program? You have one vector vi for every yi, and you know, you think of vi as one if yi equal to zero, minus one if yi equal to one. It's a vector, it, it, you know, in the in integral case, it has to be a one dimensional vector. And uh, this is one thing. Second thing, you have vector i, which is, which has to be equal to one in the integral case. And uh, the third part is crucial. So you have a local distribution mu sub p, a local probability distribution over the assignments to the predicate to the variables in the predicate p uh, in the yeah, for all p in you have a probability for every constraint or every clause. You have a probability distribution over all the possible two to the number variable p assignments. You have a probability distribution over them. So these are the variables over of your semi-definite program. And uh, of course, what you want to maximize is essentially Oh, it's a it's a probability distribution over the so there are v of p variables on or which for every class p look at a class right. p there are v of p variables there are two to the that many two to the v of p uh, uh, different assignments to the that class you have a probability distribution over those different assignments so essentially you this is like two to the v of p different linear lp variables mu p comma x will be the probability that uh, those that class is assigned x. So, uh, so this is a variable in your SDP. Yeah, these are the variables in the SDP. So you have vectors. Oh, it's just uh, i, which oh. is one, ah, okay. which it should denote one. I should denote one, and mu of p, which should denote. Uh, Yeah. So actually, if you, yeah, let me, let me write the constraints. So first of all, you want mu sub p to be a distribution, right? So you can actually say summation over all assignments of mu of mu sub p comma a is a one. You know, it's a pro valid probability distribution over assignments, and so, on. so that is. Uh, you know, uh, fine, and the only you know constraint is actually v i dot. There are two constraints. One is v i dot v j is actually let me not use dot. It's confusing. So v i inner product with v j, the vector inner product should agree with the first uh, with the two two moment of the corresponding distribution. So v i inner product v j should be equal to rotation over. So if I look at any class, and if I look at two variables inside the class, the local distribution gives me some two moment, you know, second moment for you know the ex expectation of xi xj. That should be equal to 
the inner product vi dot vj. And uh, similarly, you have the first moment, which should also be equal. Same condition. So the vector inner product should be consistent with the first two moments of their local distributions. That's the only condition you have in the semi-definite program. Okay, so, so this is the SDP, we solve it. So you get vectors, vector assignments for each variable. So you get vi for each yi. Now you want to round it. And you want to round it as in you want to produce one minus one assignments. And what you have at hand is actually a sequence of polymorphisms. You, for any tau you ask, you get a polymorphism, which is alpha approximate and uh, this. And uh, so the idea of the algorithm is actually very simple. Uh, so, so we have this instance i, right? And what we have is access to polymorphisms. You know, let's. I have nothing to do with the other i. Uh, yes. So this is actually yeah, bold i or something. <laughs> yeah, actually, there's a nicer thing. We have an instance. Uh, you can call the instance the calligraphic C because it's really This is a. Uh, oh, uh, it's a. Uh, uh, right, right, yeah. Yes, yeah, so you have an instance and you have a set of polymorph sequence of polymorphisms. Uh, any uh, of every. Uh, these are alpha approximate polymorphisms. So, you know, I, what you know about these polymorphisms is if you give it solutions of value C and you apply F. You know, you apply f here, coordinate-wise. What you get is a output solution of value alpha times c. On average. On average, yeah. Yeah. So we'll get a randomized algorithm. Uh, but you know, we cannot. We do not have uh, solutions of value c. So what do we do? So we s feed in something which looks like the solutions of value c. C is like optimum. So suppose we feed in the optimum solutions you would get a solution which is alpha times opt and you get alpha approximation algorithm. But we do not have these access to these. So we'll feed in something which is actually has looks similar to optimal solutions. What do I mean? It has the first two moments being the same as the optimal solution. And then uh, the plan is we hope that the function f does not distinguish whether you fed it optimal integral solutions or some uh, so integrally you would have, you know, some, suppose these are the integral solution, you'll have one minus one assignments. But we're gonna feed it in something which looks in a point one, minus one point one, some real valued solution. And uh, the, the hope is that the function does not distinguish and it still outputs alpha optimal uh, um, assignment. Uh, so, right, so what are the two things which I've missed out? One is, uh, so, uh, so let me go one by one. So f first, what are these optimal, uh, what are these uh, solutions which look like optimal solutions that you can? All you have is the output of your IPC, it's all that. Yeah, you just have vectors, with vector output, and you want to do something with them. And, uh, uh, actually, no, that is not a good so idea. Out of the vector, you want to uh, uh, one vector solution, one dimensional solution. Yes. Right, so you have vectors in some n dimensional surface, and you want to produce solutions, one dimensional solutions, R of them. And you know the natural thing is to do projections, random projections. So, uh, you know, okay, these I'll call real solutions because these are not integral. <laughs> so, real solution, how do I generate? I'll just pick a random Gaussian. You know, G is a random Gaussian vector 
uh, of dimension same as the SDP solution. Essentially, I pick a random direction and project all my vectors along that direction and look at the value of the projection. So, so Oh, that's actually a very good point. Uh, 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 yeah, I, I will do something very close to a projection. Right. So I'll define uh, zi to be So what did I do here? Uh, zi is actually so. So now I have, I have you know I've generated a solution z1 to zn given a Gaussian random vector. I just generated a solution z1 to zn which I'm going to use as a row there. And how did I generate it? So uh, I want to preserve. Uh, so so ideally you would just want to take the projection. You would just say, let me look at vi comma the inner product inner product of vi with the Gaussian vector, that's your zi. That's your one dimensional solution. That, that would be nice. Uh, but you all, the, if you look at the expectation of this, this is always 0. Or random Gaussian is always 0. But your uh, vec random variables have uh, expectations which are non-zero. Could be non-zero expectation. So what you do is essentially you take your vector, you take off the component along the constant direction. So this vi dot i is a constant term. It doesn't depend on g. And I'm vi minus th that is the like the term, which is orthogonal to vi. And I take it g. And uh, so this is. Uh, is for some problems, you can assume right, that you've reached the state of the zero. Yeah, yeah, some problems you can assume, yeah. But otherwise, you can do this. Uh, and so this is a. so. So now you know z1 to zn is actually so z equal to z1 to zn is my real valued solution, and uh, uh, it's fairly uh, you know so it's very e easy to s show this lemma that if I look at expectation of zi zj for over the random Gaussian g. It is exactly equal to the inner product of vi and vj, and furthermore, so th hence it is also equal to xi xj under the local integral distribution mu sub p. So uh, these real valued vectors variables actually match the first two moments of the local integral distributions. And uh, no, that's a, no, this is actually ve very easy to show. It, it, it's, a, uh, it's just a verification from the following uh, fact. It's not a claim, it's a fact. If I look at uh, two vectors u and, y u and v, and then I look at expectation or random Gaussian of the product of the projections, This is actually equal to the inner product of the vectors, and uh, yeah. So, so uh, yeah. So in fact, this is the only thing we are going to use in the proof, and the fact that Gaussian somehow have bounded third moments. So you could work with not just Gaussian projections, but you could pick a three, four wise independent family of vectors, and it's. I think yeah, the proof will go through. Uh, not entirely, but you still have uh, in you still have to uh, yeah. Uh, but it got, it's going to take n to the r time because you have to do it independently for each. Uh, so I'm going. So this is just w so this z to z one to z n. Will just is just giving me one row here. I I want to do it independently r times, so it'll take. Uh, but 
uh, yeah, so this is, uh, so, so we got our zi's. They are some real valid vectors with the same moments. Now, how do we feed it into an f? Now, as we know, we can just write the function f as a multilinear polynomial, just Fourier expansion. So function f was uh, originally taking in bits and outputting bits. Now we write it as Fourier expansion, and we can feed it in any real value. It'll output some real value. So that's the point. So, so now we, you know, can feed it in, right? Right. Okay. So before I go, so why do we think such a thing would work? So what do we know about these polymorphisms? we know that they are actually low influence polymorphisms. That's our definition. So uh, we are going to use the fact that a low influence function, a low influence pol polynomial, and low, uh, which is low degree, cannot distinguish between uh, two distributions which have the same first two moments. So this is a, a very important uh, theorem it's called the invariance principle and uh, so you can think of it as a generalization of the central limit theorem so what is central limit theorem saying suppose i have look at this polynomial summation xi by root n if i look at this polynomial now if i feed it in iid plus minus 1 values the output looks like a gaussian if i feed it in iid gaussian values the output still looks like a Gaussian. So which means the distribution of P of X uh, is somehow invariant and under uh, feeding it in different distributions. It only depends on the first two moments. Uh, of course, uh, also we need bounded third moment, but. Uh, you don't need uh, low influence for F, right? You only need it on average. You only need it for average. Uh, so I, I think you could do it You, you, if you would have to worry a little bit because uh, the bounds look like tau, not they're not linear in tau, the error bounds. Uh, but th the error bounds are not linear in tau. So the linearity of expectation doesn't just work as well. And uh, and you know, in the somehow, you know, if, since you're making tau going to zero anyway, it doesn't matter because you can just throw out the polymorphisms which have large influence. There will be very small number of them. You can just mark out, you can just throw it out and create a new polymorphism, which is, um, yeah. Uh, that's uh, right, so, so, so that's the po uh, claim, right? So you have a polynomial and, uh, and, and uh, so that is uh, essentially encapsulated in the invariance principle. So I'll, uh, you know, I'm going to read it out when, uh, yeah, I need it, yeah. <laughs> oh, actually, so there's no way to have this in front and right here, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, and then to erase this, uh, but yeah, I, I was just hoping that uh, it's a, uh, no erasure uh, process. Okay, yeah. So now we are. So actually now let me st uh, state the algorithm itself directly. So uh, actually I can't find it. Okay. So the algorithm is just uh, generate G1 to GR random Gaussians. Then from them you will generate these rows Z1, Z2, ZR. These are independent copies. And you apply, uh, le let's say, I will call it 
h equal to t 1 minus epsilon f. You have a polymorphism f, look at the smoothened version, apply it on these uh, things. So, you apply it column wise. Uh, right, right, yeah. So, now it is going to be even lower influence, but it is low degree now. So, h is f was not low degree, but h is low degree now. So, you can apply it column wise. So, you are going to get h of z 1 up to z r, a new uh, new vector. And uh, so, this will be a vector which is uh, which has real values, because h is a polynomial and you are feeding it real values. Now, you are going to use the trivial rounding. So, round this vector, let us call this uh, actually uh, y. So, round y equal to y n to y n to an assignment. How do you round it? It is very simple. If y i is outside the interval uh, is less than minus 1, you make it minus 1. If y i is greater than 1, you make it 1. If it is in between, you just use the correct probability. So, uh, randomly um, set it to 1 or minus 1 with the correct probability. So that was so. so that's the algorithm, and uh, so uh, yes. So yeah, I can work now. Oh, so you, you look at the function f. It's a Boolean function. It's a function on the Boolean cube. You apply it as in. Uh, in oh, r, dimensions. r dimensions, you apply it as in you uh, you apply the operator, you get another function, as in so you at each point you replace the value by the average in the neighborhood of epsilon neighborhood, and that's a new function now, and the new function actually is low degree, and uh, let's say. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot to say that. Yeah, somewhere here you just say sample f from the. Yeah. This is the last step. When y is in, you will get some value in between minus and one. You just randomly set it to one number. Oh, t is an f is a function which outputs real values. It could be in minus and one, right? It. Right, right. Yeah, that's the problem. So I'm I'm moved to Boolean alphabet. But otherwise, you can think of it as outputting a distribution, which is a q-dimensional vector, and you're just averaging the q-dimensional vector in any way. Yeah. So, so that is the thing. And uh, first of all, one point is, why is, you know, why is H a good polymorphism if F is a good polymorphism, right? And uh, going to state two very, very simple lemmas. First of all, uh, if you have, suppose you have distributions d1 to dr on solutions to an instance i, then uh, if you just sample one solution from each of these distributions, And you apply a polymorphism on this, uh, on this. Okay. Uh, so essentially, what we know about polymorphism is if you feed it in single solutions of value c, its output is at least alpha times c. Now I'm saying that I have these distributions whose expected value is at least c. The expected value of the each of each of these distributions is at least c. I pick one from each of those distributions, apply f, the value is at least alpha times c, the expected value. 
and you know this is a very uh, silly i mean very easy to see because uh, a polymorphism should work on all instances right so i have some instance i right so no actually so i have some instance i which is like bunch of variables right and uh, i'll make multiple copies of this instance so many copies of this instance and now my solutions to this largest instance will be samples the first solution will be you know i'll sample repeatedly from distribution d1 and second copy i'll just sample repeatedly from distribution d2 and dr the value of each of these will be at least c so when i combine the value will be at least alpha times c uh, oh, so so this is actually yeah, I, should, I should have moved it to the earlier when I defined polymorphism. So this is just a issue with the definition of the polymorphism. It's, a, it's just a variant. So suppose in the polymorphism we said that given any set of solutions right. of value c, the output is alpha times c. I'm just saying that not just a set of solutions. Suppose I give you a bunch of distributions or solutions. Each of them have expectation at least C. Then when you pick randomly and you apply this, you still get alpha times C. And the proof is that I've given some instance I and I've given some set of distributions. So look at D1. I'll, I'll create a new instance which is repetition. And I look at D1. I uh, repeat the. So this is from H C, uh, from H C to H also. Exactly. C from C to uh, yeah. If, if you can, since you can make it infinite, essentially you can make it equal to this, right? So the vi value of each of these is actually C. The output when you apply should be at least. So not the value of each of these. So the concept of. Yeah. Yeah. No, but uh, for, for, the for for this uh, the value of this for this bigger instance. So now by this I prime instance which is like many copies of instance right? and the values are C and the output has to be at least value C and the output is exactly. So this is, you know, it's a, it's like a definitional issue. It's just, it's not a, right. So now, you know, the, it's easy to prove lemma two from here. Essentially, if F is a alpha approximate uh, polymorphism, then T one minus epsilon f is an alpha minus epsilon, you know, some constant order epsilon, alpha minus order epsilon, approximate polymorphism. And this is uh, easy because. So what does f is an alpha approximate polymorphism mean? Uh, given any instance, and if you take a bunch of rows. Given any instance, if I apply uh, so each of value c, the output has value at least alpha times c, right? Now I randomly perturb each bit with probability epsilon. The value of a solution changes by at most c minus order epsilon because each constraint, let's look at a clause. A clause is on three variables. Uh, you know, its value when you perturb each bit by probability epsilon, its value is at least c minus order epsilon. So you have a distribution whose expectation is at least C minus order epsilon, which is the output is at least alpha minus alpha times C minus order epsilon, which is it's constant. It's some constant. It's some three or k. So these two, I mean, this sequence is just to show that if F is a good polymorphism, then H is. This addition of noise does not uh, change. Yeah, so When you fix the, it doesn't break. It just that when you fix the C. Yes. If you don't fix the C, it still works. Yeah. Right. And uh, okay. So, so now we are uh, in good shape. So, everything is there. Now I just have to. Um, uh, so the algorithm's proof is very easy. Uh, so let's. Uh, I'll just. Uh,
Eso es el... Ok, thanks. Expectation. Right. Ok, so what is the... Right, so I can close. Oh, 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 that was a way, right, yeah. Th that was a way to do that, no? I said, yeah. It was, uh <laughs> Right, so now this is the algorithm, and we want to show it works. And it's going to be, like, uh, just uh, very simple. So what is the expected value of the output? here, output solution. So you first pick a random polymorphism, right? So uh, from this distribution, that is the third step there. You pick a random Gaussians, then you pick, uh, so now you want to look at what's the value you get for a sample like this. You're picking some predicate and uh, checking if it is satisfied. So P of, so I'll call this, uh, entire operation we did here, this rounding step. I'll call it round. P of round of f of z1, comma round of f of z2, So, okay, so le let me pick some notation. So let's say the predicate P is on variables one to k, whenever we want it. Right, so Z1 is essentially the, so Z1 is the z first column here. Z2 is the second column. Z3 is the third column and so on. So actually H of Z1, H of Z2, H of Zk. Okay, this is what is uh, uh, the value. And now uh, it's, uh, So now I'll just interchange the order of expectation. I'll start looking at one predicate instead of looking at uh, this. So I'll say, now G of this same quantity, right? Now, so now you know, they have an expectation and you have this Gaussian random variables. We are feeding in Gaussian variable, random variables is H, applying this round, and we, so now we'll apply the invariance principle. So what is the invariance principle? I'm gonna apply a fairly strong version of invariance principle, which is like ve for vector valued random variables. What I'll do is I'll look at this H of Z1, H of Z2, H of Zk, the K locations where the constraint is looking at. This entire K locations, it's a vector valued random variable. So it's a, it's a vector of polynomials. So I'm go right because uh, uh, so so uh, so I have p of pr so let's actually yeah so let me call psi of uh, b1 to bk to be equal to p of round of b1 round of bk. So that, that this is a, yeah, these are, so B1 to BK are real numbers, so psi is a function from R to the K, it outputs a payoff R. So, uh, so really what you have inside is just psi of, you know, H of Z1, H of Zk. Okay, now, uh, so now essentially, uh, so what invariance principle tells you is that the distribution of this whole vector, H of Z1, H of Z, H of Zk, is the same, whether, uh, same as H of X1, H of Xk, where Xi's are sampled from the local integral distribution. That is, so how does it say that? So it says the following. So suppose you have an ensemble. You have like X1 to Xr. Uh, these are like R independent copies. You have IID ensemble, so you have, uh, so I'm looking at this, looking at this K cross R matrix. This is K, this is R. 
So suppose you have, uh, you know, a s R independent ensembles of random variables, and suppose you have a set of polynom polynomials which are uh, which on these random variables, you have k polynomials, multilinear polynomials, such that their variance is one, uh, which is like normalization. The influence of each of those polynomials is small. Oh, oh, yes. Uh, so you have a sequence of uh, ensembles, and uh, so, uh, and if I look at any, so let's look at an ensemble like that is a single row. If I look at this uh, k bits, and if I look at the probability of any occurrence, a non probability of any occurrence, probability of zero one zero one one zero, it has to be at least some alpha, alpha naught. Right, right, but in our case, we don't even care about this because you know we have a given SDP solution, right? So the local distributions will have some alpha. We don't even know what alpha is. A zero is fine. If it's non-zero, it has to be alpha. Uh, it's all for anything that's out in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The non-zero probability in this universe should be at least alpha. So. Yeah, so you have multilinear polynomials with low influence. Suppose you have a set of Gaussian ran random variables with the same k cross r matrix, with the same uh, matching moments, the first two moments match. Then, you know, the h of, uh, you know, f, when you apply f, uh, so h is t1 minus epsilon f. So if I apply h of z, or h of x, the distribution looks the same. And the way you're going to say that is the expectation of your distribution under any con reasonably good function is the same. So way to say that x and y, two random variables are close distribution, is to say, another way to say that is you look at expectation of psi of x minus psi of y under a good psi, which is like continuous, this is small. Uh, sorry, expectation of psi of x minus expectation of psi of y small. So essentially they show that if you have any Lipschitz continuous function, any function such that psi of x minus psi of y is at most constant times x minus y, the two norm, then you have uh, psi of that is same minus psi of that is zero, very small. It goes to zero as tau goes to zero, as the influences go to zero. Oh, so psi of h of z. So this is h1 of z, h2 of z, hk of z, which are gov x. X is like the integral distribution. And what's the bound of the So A is the Lipschitz constant of your psi. Uh, CK is some constant which depends on the vector. Uh, K, K, on K. Plus K is like zero. Right? Yeah. And uh, this epsilon is this epsilon. And this log one over alpha comes from here. But you know, for us, it, it, the, all these things are fixed and only tau goes to zero. So. This 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 whole term goes to zero. So you know this is actually um, okay. The w only crucial thing here is that this applying this rounding and taking the p off. This whole thing is a Lipschitz continuous. Uh, well, you have to say that you don't expect to get very high values uh, above one or below minus one. Oh, so those no. things are all hidden now in the. Yeah, uh, uh, Oh, it is Lipschitz. The no, this this function is Lipschitz continuous, as defined. Because what will happen is, if two, if a value is more than one, the round will just truncate it to one. So essentially, if I look at psi of x minus psi of y, psi of x minus psi of y, this is a you know, if x and y have value coordinates greater than one, they'll just become one. So this is at most uh, x minus y, two norm times some constant. No, no, the, well, uh, P is a multilinear, yeah, uh, P, is, yeah, 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 but P, yeah. Okay, so one, P is a multilinear polynomial, so you can, it's the, so, so, okay, so the only thing we used was that our rounding is continuous, Lipschitz continuous. So now we can replace this by H, so, uh, sorry, with by X, 
So, now you are uh, basically done. So, now you get the same uh, actually let me erase this whole thing. P of psi of h of you know if I feed in the integral values what happens? And what happens if you feed in the integral values? Uh, the rounding does not change it at all, right? I mean, you don't round things which are within one and minus one. So this is exactly equal to uh, just uh, it's equal to just p of h of x one h of x k. Uh, I guess yeah. So anyway, so so, huh? Yeah, no, it's exactly. Equal. Uh, no, but uh, p is multilinear polynomial, right? Uh, but so this is equal, and now you are just. Right. So actually, yeah. So no, this. Uh, so uh, yeah. I'll yeah. So you don't need any such arguments here because uh, uh, we already did the Lipschitz continuous, and uh, if you got integral values, you don't change the value. If you got integral values, you don't change the value of the output because if I got values within one minus one, I don't truncate it at all. So this is equal to the payoff I get on this. This is equal to the payoff I get, and this is essentially. So if I interchange the expectation, right? So this is at least alpha times the SDP. What is this? This is the value of the solution H applied to uh, x1 to xk. It's at least alpha times the SDP contribution of this clause. So and uh, that's because F is a polynomial, and uh, so that finishes the proof. So uh, uh, there is yeah. So there's no details which I missed. It's just uh, uh, I was a little fast towards the end. That's all. Uh, yeah, th there's no ugly things going on. Okay. Uh, 